The environmental microbiology lecture is one of the uh, most important staples of our um, society's year of uh, program uh, of events. Um, and this year is made even more special by the fact that we are also celebrating the retirement, not celebrating, but marking the retirement. <laughs> 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 celebrating after a fashion, um, and marking the retirement of Professor Ken Timmis, FRS. Ken established the journal in 1999, as I mentioned, and along with microbial biotechnology and environmental reports, these journals have become the go-to journals in the field. And looking at the list of uh, authors and editors, um, the impressive list of names that have published and served in the journal uh, is really remarkable. And he has taken the journal really in that time from strength to strength. As I said, it has become the go-to, the, the, the family of journals have become the go-to journals in the field. And environmental microbiology is, is one of the jewels in the crown. He, the, the journals are, of course, central to our success as a society. So we're deeply indebted to Ken for his service over the past 24 years, now into the 25th year. And we are here uh, especially to thank him this evening for his dedication over that time um, and his years of long service uh, to the Society and to the journals. Ken, on behalf of the Society uh, for Applied Microbiology, um, I want to thank you, express our deepest and sincerest gratitude to you personally and uh, for everything that you've done uh, for the Society and for the, the journals. And we wish you well in your retirement, although I understand that it is only a a, a, a passing from one phase to the next. I know you're very passionate about the Microbial Literacy Project and we wish you all the very best in, in, in your future endeavours in that area. So, um, Ken hands over the reins of environmental microbiology to the very capable hands of uh, Juan Lewis and I'm going to hand over equally to uh, Juan Lewis to say a few words on, uh, f uh, about you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, well, uh, it's really impossible to <clears throat> to sum up uh, in two minutes what Ken and Joa have been doing for for the journals in our society. Um, I would like to take this minute to thank um, them on behalf of the past and um, present editors of the journal for founding them, promoting, growing, and consolidating them. As Brendan said, uh, <clears throat> in a couple of months, we will, and now, celebrating the 25th anniversary of EMI and the 15th anniversary of uh, EMIR. Um, they are very well consolidated journals, and what they are today is the, the, the result of an exceptional vision of science of Ken and the support <coughs> by John. They, they have been really visionary, able to think outside the, the box, and more importantly, ahead of time. So thank you very much for the work you have been putting and all the efforts. I, I would like also to introduce Ken's uh, presentation. He's going to to, to, to talk about the need to enlighten a society on the role microorganism is playing in our everyday life. Uh, he's keeping us very busy, so uh, I don't think he's retiring, he's just moving activity. So thank you very much for, for all the work you have done. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, um, Brendan and uh, Juan Lewis, for these very nice words. It um, is quite emotional for me to hear them, but uh, I'm happy to hear them. So, um, well, good evening, everybody, first of all. So it's been a, a source of considerable satisfaction to me to create and to nurture uh, two, three successful uh, journals that have stimulated and published top research in the important areas of environmental microbiology and microbial biotechnology, and that have provided the Society for Applied Microbiology with significant income that has been 
uh, used, uh, able to be used to, to further its aims in supporting and advancing these subjects. I should also like to express uh, my deep gratitude to all of those who contributed to the success uh, of the journals. First and foremost, Joan, who made everything work, supported everyone, and put out all the fires. Um, our dedicated editors, reviewers, uh, and authors, and of course, SFAM and Wiley. And I particularly want to thank Juan Lewis for his outstanding and uh, very crucial contributions to the success of the journals and for accepting to take over the EIC task. He will undoubtedly take the journals to new heights. But this evening, rather than uh, discuss anything about the journals, I would like to say a few words about uh, the topic of microbiology and human stewardship of planet Earth. So at the beginning of this year, uh, John Hallsworth and I published a crystal ball article in Microbial Biotechnology entitled The Darkest Biosphere, which deals with human stewardship of the biosphere in the Anthropocene and its consequences. It consists of a dialogue between a young microbe and her granny in the deep subsurface of the Iberian pyrite belt in the post-Anthropocene era, discussing what went wrong with the surface biosphere. The date of the, uh, the microbial chat uh, is not specified in the article because neither John nor I had any idea when the planet would cease to support human existence. So what I should briefly like to do today is to discuss the role of applied microbiology can have in pushing back the date of our extinction. So what are the issues? So the first issue, problem one, is sustainability. So human development is currently on an unsustainable trajectory, which is why the United Nations formulated its sustainable development goals, which are meant to uh, put uh, humanity on a more sustainable development trajectory. So these were published in uh, 2015, and they uh, were said that it was said at the time that uh, they can work if they are achieved by the year 2030. So we're currently at the halfway mark, and a recent report bleakly informed us that we're nowhere near on track to achieve this. So what to do? Well, uh, many, some would say all SDGs are impacted by microbes and their activities, with some crucially, being crucially impacted. And to learn more about this, I draw your attention to the September 2017 special issue of microbial biotechnology, which was dedicated to this topic. But amazingly, Microbial contributions to the achievement of the SDGs are not on the radar screens of most people making the key decisions on how to achieve the SDGs. The potential of microbial contributions to solutions is seriously underexploited. Just consider, for example, uh, the issue of plant, soil, climate, microbe nexus, where microbes play a pivotal role in soil fertility and agricultural productivity and can be better exploited to increase crop yields, to increase plant resilience to stresses, and hence to extend plant cultivation ranges and land utility. And if you'd be interested to learn more about that, I direct you to an article published in uh, Microbial Biotechnology in 2021 by Juan Lewis and myself. That addresses, of course, <coughs> the issue of, uh, of one of the SDGs, which is to do with uh, ending uh, starvation. Problem two, planetary boundaries and global warming tipping points. So these are environmental red lines. Once they're crossed, there's no going back. And here there's frightening news. We have already overshot six of the nine planetary boundaries, including biodiversity loss, chemical pollution, excess inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus into water bodies, and climate change. And there's equally depressing news about exceeding tipping points, such as disintegration of the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets and loss of mountain glaciers, with multiple consequences, but especially rising sea levels, coastal flooding, and loss of coastal habitability. The issue of loss and damage of small island and coastal nations, which will certainly figure large in COP27. Well, microbes are centrally involved in global warming, both as producers and consumers of greenhouse gases, in the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles and eutrophication, and in organism 
organismal health and resilience to stresses. And they offer a diverse range of powerful mitigation strategies in the context of planetary boundaries and global warming. However, such strategies are not adequately considered in potential mitigation policies. Problem three, we're faced by an unprecedented number of humanitarian crises. Just to mention a few, extreme weather events caused by global warming, the COVID pandemic, antimicrobial resistance, starvation and lack of clean water in parts of the world, an obesity epidemic, increasing mental health problems, pervasive and persistent uh, pollutants and endocrine disrupting chemicals, and so on and so on. And again, microbes play key roles in all of these crises, either as causes or potential solutions. And again, we are failing to fully exploit the potential of microbes to contribute to solutions, such as accelerating replacement of polluting agrochemicals with non-polluting agrobiologicals. Problem number four, and this is the key overarching problem, is decisioning by policymakers, policy conflicts and insufficient knowledge of causes and potential solutions to crises. Policymakers are simply not adequately confronting global problems and crises. They got, global policy lacks its vital urgency. Witness the, the negotiation difficulties in COP26 and previous COPs and subsequent implementation failures. There are understandable reasons uh, for this. Decision takers are preoccupied with the economy, with energy security, food security, and geopolitical instabilities. Nevertheless, we still have the global crises. So how can decision makers at all levels and societal stakeholders be enabled to appreciate the seriousness of global problems? Basic education is considered to be key to preparing children for adulthood. So must play a role in preparing us for perhaps our most important task as adults, namely stewardship of the planet. There is a discussion in a number of countries right now as to what children need to learn in school in order to be fitter for the future and its challenges. So there is a, an awareness of the need for change in school curricula. Most importantly, and this is my key message this evening, is that the, most of the problems that we are facing now are multi-generational. So our children and their children will be both faced with the issues and will be the stewards. So our children are part of the solution. Providing them with the knowledge needed to make objective, evidence-based decisions is not only vital, it is part of the generational contract. But astonishingly, in almost none of the discussions about sustainability, humanitarian crises, planetary boundaries, and so on, does basic education of children feature as a key strategic component? Just look, for example, at the excellent O'Neill report on antimicrobial resistance, which emphasizes the need for information campaigns to increase public awareness, but does not mention basic education. Educating our children about sustainability, global crises, and so on, their causes, potential solution solutions and mitigation options must be a cornerstone of any strategy for lasting sustainable stewardship of humanity, the biosphere and the planet. And because microbes and their activities are so germane to many of the grand challenges facing us, inclusion, including inclusion of relevant microbiology in basic education must be implemented. So to address this need, the International Microbiology Literacy Initiative, the IMLI, is creating the resources needed to teach societally relevant microbiology at all levels of basic education with the goal of being an enabler of evidence-based decisions at all levels of society. It aims to democratize microbiology knowledge and its potential to, serve problem, to, to solve problems. So what kind of microbiology is both child relevant and relevant to adult stewardship of the lives of individuals, of families, of communities, of nations, of, of the planet. And let me provide just one example to illustrate this, the topic of family pets, such as pet dogs. So this is obviously child relevant because many families have a pet dog and other families are considering to get a pet dog. What is the um, adult stewardship angle here? Well, a pet dog provides the child with 
and the family with greater exposure to microbial diversity, which is important for both microbiome diversity and the health aspects relevant to this um, in the family, including a development of a healthy immune system in infants. But a pet can get infections, so children learn about infections. They learn about zoonoses, very relevant for the current COVID, uh, understanding the current COVID pandemic. And they learn about vaccines, something that they are likely to experience on multiple occasions. Pets must be fed, and pet food production is associated with a very significant environmental footprint, and in addition, is associated with competition with human food production, so it's related to food security. So in this one lesson about pet dogs, kids learn about human health aspects of microbes and microbiomes, food security, global warming, eutrophication, and loss of biodiversity. This is what I mean by societally relevant microbiology. Not only that, but each of the lessons that are being created, A, identifies the SDGs implicated in the microbiology presented, and so directly teaches children about sustainability and the SDGs. B, it identifies and promotes as class discussion topics, decision issues impacted by the microbiology discussed, and so directly addresses the issue of stewardship and policy development. And C, identifies and promotes as class discussion topics, stakeholder relevant aspects, and so directly addresses the issue of accountability by decision takers. All resources are being created pro bono by a network of many hundreds of microbiologists worldwide and are being made freely available. The first Emily Regional Center was created this year by Ruplal in India and will be re releasing over the next few weeks on its website the first Emily teaching resources into earlier some 170 class lessons. Thank you very much. <laughs>